will begin shortly. Sorry about that. Yeah, ready? Yes, David, please go ahead. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Breaking Barriers, Health Workforce Policies for Pandemic Response and Preparedness. I want to thank all of our partners for making this a possibility, bringing us all together today. You'll see at the bottom of the slide there, all of our fantastic partners, members of our coalition that have brought you this webinar today. Uh, we have an exciting uh, group of panelists. So I want you to think about your questions for all of these terrific guests we have from ministries of health, uh, from county level uh, health ministries as well. We're gonna be hearing from uh, experts from five countries, excuse me, to really zero in on their experiences as government officials with responding to a pandemic and thinking about the future of what are the workforce policies that we need to respond effectively, uh, but to also prepare for the next pandemic. We're gonna delve into all of those questions in an informal style with moderation from Dr. Rose Clark Nanyanga from uh, Uganda. But before we get there, I wanna turn it over to a, a video and show you just a, a little bit of a presentation that we developed at Frontline Health Workers Coalition in working closely with frontline health workers to bring their voices to policymakers. We were not prepared for the COVID-19 pandemic. We did not have enough masks or the protective equipment. Health workers were overwhelmed and there were not enough of us to treat the huge number of patients that were overflowing in the facility. We are still not prepared. Every country must have a strong health system and a workforce that can detect and stop unexpected threats. The global death toll for health workers has reached at least 115,000. We have lost many health workers to the pandemic. We can't afford to lose anymore. Viruses do not respect borders. We must strengthen health system everywhere to prevent the next pandemic. Government leaders have made commitment to do this around the world. Now we must hold them to their promises. The world will lack 18 million health workers by the year 2030 without adequate investment. With increasing health needs, these shortages have serious consequences. In Uganda, 14,000 patients miss medical care when just one doctor dies. Our patients need us, and if we are not safe, our patients are not safe. Applauding health workers does not cure disease, provide life-saving treatments, or prevent women from dying in childbirth. People do. It's time we invest in them. The Community Healthcare Workers Program and the front line will be extremely important in the coming months and if not years in our ability to fight COVID. We must act now to prevent the next pandemic. Let's ensure health workers safety and security, provide funding for surge capacity and continue to train more even in this trying time. Contact leaders in government today and tell them we can't wait for the next pandemic to support frontline health workers. We need to act now. As you can see, it's a powerful video that really brings forward the voices of health workers from the Philippines, from Kenya, and from the United States. Uh, be sure to check our website for that uh, for that video and retweet it and, and share it with your policymakers. I'm going to bring to you now our first speaker uh, from the Africa CDC, Dr. Raj Tajuddin, who's the head of the Division of Public Health Institutes and Research at the Africa CDC, and he's the coordinator of the Africa CDC Institute for the Workforce. With 20 years of experience, I know you'll enjoy hearing from Dr. Raj about his perspective and what are the workforce policies needed uh, to address the current crisis, but also to prepare for the next one. Over to you, Dr. Raj.
All right. Um, good afternoon, um, colleagues, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Let me, on behalf of um, Africa CBC, welcome each and every one of us to this important um, side event at the um, UN General Assembly that is um, looking at how do we I mean, strengthen uh, public health workforce um, development, especially with emphasis on uh, community um, health uh, workers. And there's no doubt about it. We have seen the role of our community health care workers as far as a pandemic is um, concerned. If there's anything that this pandemic has uh, demonstrated is the fact that um, the community health um, workers actually have a very big um, role um, to play. Now, uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you uh, greetings from John Nkegerson, director of uh, Africa CDC, who will have actually loved to be part and parcel of this particular uh, program, because this is something that is uh, very, very close to his heart. And uh, if I may just take us uh, back um, a bit down memory lane, in 2017, our um, Assembly of Head of State and Government, which is the highest decision-making body of the African Union, did actually put um, out um, a communique or a declaration calling on the need to accelerate community healthcare workers on the continent of um, Africa. And uh, as Africa CDC, we continue to leverage on that particular instrument, you know, on that particular um, declaration. Let me shift here and take us to one of the key lessons that we've learned as far as this um, COVID-19 pandemic is um, concerned, of course, is to really, really underscore the importance of our community um, healthcare um, workers. Today, um, we continue to I mean, face a critical shortage of um, healthcare um, workers. Uh, for instance, we know that uh, as far as um, expert or advanced or trained epidemiologists are concerned, we need a uh, 6,000 plus on the continent of 1.3 billion to meet a target of one to 200,000. Today, what we currently have as a continent is 1,900. So meaning that uh, we still have a gap of 4,000 plus um, to cover. Let me also say that um, as far as frontline healthcare workers are concerned, which are like, um, uh, feed epidemiology training um, uh, a program who are embedded within the community, who are within the primary healthcare um, system. Our needs as a continent is around 25,000. What we currently have as a continent is um, just 5,000. So we have a gap there of around uh, 20,000. Um, and of course, if you go to community um, health, um, workers, of course, the gap is really, really uh, uh, big. So which further underscore the importance of what we are currently doing here um, today, just to raise the necessary awareness, do the necessary um, advocacy to ensure that, uh, I mean, we continue to drive the agenda for community health uh, workers on the um, continent. Let's look at Africa CDC um, statue. It clearly underscore the need for Africa CDC to support the 55 member states to build capacity as far as um, healthcare workers are concerned through medium and long time field um, epidemiology um, training program and frontline um, uh, 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 public um, health work um, uh, force. When we look at Agenda 2063, which is our social economic uh, blueprint, and we also look at our Africa health um, strategy, all this clearly identify the need for human resources for health as being essential for Africa to achieve its social economic development agenda, which further underscored the importance of what we are doing today on the margin of the 2021 UN General Assembly. And of course, you will agree with me that there is no way we can guarantee our air security um, as a continent without investing in public health workforce development without investing in community um, health um, care workers. Because whether we like it or not, they are our first point out of call whether we like it or not, they provide the necessary surveillance, you know, at the interface between uh, the community and the healthcare system, you know, and they play a key role like um, risk communication and community engagement, like making sure that we get good quality um, data, like when it comes to contact tracing, they have a very big role to play. When it comes to 
case investigation. They also have a lot of role to play, even when it comes to home-based isolation and care of those um, um, illnesses, including the COVID-19 itself. Our community it, uh, workers have a very, very big role um, to play. And uh, in this regard, Africa CDC, we have put in place a framework for uh, public health workforce development on the continent. And uh, some of the key, I mean, um, key activities that this uh, framework seeks um, to do is to carry out advocacy at the highest um, level. Again, which further underscore the importance of the tool, the instrument that has been put out there by our um, head of state and government in 2017 to accelerate the need for community health workers on the continent of um, um, Africa. Let me um, also say that uh, Africa CDC continue to work with um, a lot of partners um, in this space to ensure that, uh, I mean, virtually every hand is on deck to ensure that uh, we are able to scale up uh, these community health um, workers as far as the continent is um, um, a concern. And um, for me to um, conclude, I would like um, to say that uh, for um, Africa CDC, we continue to emphasize on the need for what we describe as a new public health order. And of this new public health order, we have four key pillars in there. Number one is to continue to strengthen health institutions across uh, the continent of uh, Africa. Health institutions like National Public Health Institute, health institutions like the Africa CDC itself, health institutions like a regional health organization. Number two in there is to strengthen local manufacturing capacity for diagnostics, for vaccines, for medicine, and for essential medical arm supplies. Number three, which tied closely to what we are doing here today is the need for public health workforce development. And for Africa CDC, we say that the foundation for that public health workforce development agenda on the continent is to strengthen community health workers program. Very, very important. Because that's the only way we can guarantee the health security of 1.3 billion people on the continent. And of course, the last but not the least of the new public health order, which also tie closely to what we are doing here today, is the need for respected and renewed partnership. We know that we cannot do it alone. We know that there are a lot of partners in there who have been in this game for quite um, some years. So what we do as Africa City, CDC is to catalyze the process, you know, and enlist the support of each and every our partner. So on that note, I thank you all. And um, Dr. Bell also brings um, greetings you know, to you all and is with us um, throughout this uh, particular uh, program. And I wish us a successful deliberation and that we look forward to the outcome of this uh, meeting because it's not going to be one of those um, talk and um, show. We look forward to implementing the outcome of this particular um, uh, meeting that is taking place on the margin of the UN General Assembly um, 2021. Over to you, um, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raj Tajuddin from Africa CDC. You made some critical points uh, that we all must take into account. And then I really hope policymakers take into account. As many in the audience know, tomorrow, President Biden from the United States is leading a really important summit on the response to COVID-19. I know Africa CDC will be there with, with world leaders attending. They must put these issues that you just raised on the agenda and address them proactively. I want everyone to think about questions that you want to ask uh, Dr. Raj, uh, put those in the chat. We'll come to those later. Uh, and I want to turn it over now to our moderator, uh, Dr. Rose Clark Nanyanga, who is the uh, vice chair, or vice chancellor, excuse me, at the Clark International University in Uganda. She's a nurse, and that's why I'm glad we're turning over uh, the moderation to her because nurses get the job done and we need their voice and leadership. Otherwise, we will be lost without them. Thank you, Dr. Rose, for leading the charge. Thank you so very much, uh, David. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today uh, to introduce an outstanding uh, panel of speakers who are going to expand the conversation that Dr. Raj has just been talking about to look specifically at policies during COVID. What is working? What has not worked? What lessons have we learned? First, I would like to introduce Dr. Rose Bianima. 
Dr. Rose is a Senior Health Officer, Ministry of Health, Uganda. Dr. Rose, I would like to start with you, namesake. Um, and the first question we'd like to look at is, Uganda recently enacted uh, several policies and strategies uh, to curb COVID-19, uh, including the community engagement strategy. How have these strategies helped ensure that those at the last mile service during the pandemic receive care? Thank you very much, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here to represent my minister, Honorable General Ruth Acheng, who was unable to be here and uh, she delegated me. Um, the Deputy Executive Director of Mulago National Referral Hospital, and we are the biggest COVID treatment center. As Ministry of Health, of course, as Mulago, we are also part of Ministry of Health. We've had several initiatives really to strengthen the workforce uh, towards COVID-19. And we are happy to be part of this uh, discussion. Uh, when the outbreak started, already the ministry had put in place um, a national health uh, work, workforce planning for COVID-19 unit, and it focused mainly on uh, increasing the health workforce for the pandemic. And uh, of course, not increasing the numbers, but also training them to equip them with the skills, especially in uh, infection prevention and control, and also skilling them on uh, areas like oxygen therapy. You know, it was a big, big issue, uh, oxygen therapy. And of course, at the forefront were the nurses. Rose, I'm sure you are happy to hear that. Uh, many health workers were recruited and they were given training and we ensured that there was equitable distribution of this health workforce to ensure that uh, the peripheral regional referral hospitals also have the capacity. Of course, it wasn't easy. Um, and uh, we had to make sure that we also try and get the necessary equipment which they require and also equitably distribute these commodities. Thank you, and over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose. I will come back to you. Um, thank you for that focus on the nursing workforce. We know that they are the largest uh, of the healthcare workforce. And uh, it makes me uh, really happy to hear that they were prioritized in our policy making. I would like to briefly move now uh, to our next panelist, Dr. Gregory Ganda, County Executive Committee Member for Health Services, Chisumu County in Kenya. Dr. Ganda, uh, tell us a little bit about policy changes that you have undertaken in Chisumu County to strengthen the health workforce and what impact do you expect to see from these changes to build on Dr. Bianima's conversation with that experience in Uganda? What is happening in Chisumu? Thank you very much uh, for the question and the opportunity to speak to you today and share with all of you. In Kisumu County, we have a, a raft of small policy changes, but the major things that we've done is one, we have enacted a County Health Act, which among other, among other things details how we will support the county's entire health workforce through conducting training or capacity needs assessment, and using that to inform efforts uh, that will put on in place continuous training and development programs for the health professionals. Secondly, we are setting up structures for optimal recruitment, deployment, and remuneration of community health workers, which already began, but we are now transforming them into policy. Particularly about COVID-19, we had uh, several lessons which we learned during the COVID time uh, in recruitment and training of health workers. Uh, we learned that recruitment processes took too long uh, when workers were needed urgently, and that needed to be, to be dealt with. We had small policy changes that allowed us to employ urgently, but now we are doing a draft uh, HR policy, which is complete, 
that will allow uh, the county in future and the government in future to be able to hire workforce on short notice by having ready-made data banks that they can rely on. Uh, we've also worked on our training policy and we are now going to rely heavily on programs that are locally developed. One of the things we learned is that we lost patients uh, in the initial phase of the program because our healthcare workers had gone through trainings that had not been done by us. And so some of the equipment which were in those training protocols did not exist. And so they were stuck. For example, we were talking about pulse oximeters in the initial phase and they did not have any pulse oximeters to follow up their patients with. So we had to quickly develop uh, uh, local policies for training. And that has now been found part of our agenda that we will be developing our locally uh, developed programs for use of healthcare workers. Uh, we also developed a mandatory training for new diseases because it's getting sometimes healthcare workers trained becomes difficult. But when you have a new disease which is coming, then it has to be made mandatory for it to work. And we applied this and now we are meeting it into policy. Of course, there is also the uh, policy of task shifting. Initially, it was difficult to imagine that you can have somebody in the community, now a community health volunteer, to follow up a case in, in the case of home based care and uh, in, in the communities. That forced us to move in very fast and allow the community health volunteers to be able to move the patients uh, back to the community. Um, another lesson which we've learned is the access to services during, uh, during COVID. And we learned a lot about how strong the community health workforce is. You'll be surprised that during uh, the COVID-19, when we uh, shifted our tasks towards the community health volunteers, some of our indicators, for example, skilled birth attendance uh, improved, for example, from 69% to 81% in some of our, our areas. So we are taking that strongly and we have set up a community health services bill, uh, a drafted one and passed it through our cabinet and it will be presented to assembly for, for further processing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ganda. Um, we will continue to expand that conversation with you. I'll get back to you. But I would like now to travel a little bit to Nigeria. We are delighted to have Dr. Joseph Amadou, Senior Director, Federal Ministry of Health in Nigeria. Uh, Dr. Amadou, first, prior to your current role with the National Blood Transfusion Service, you chaired Nigeria's Surgical Obstetric Trauma an anesthesia care planning committee with a focus on human resources for health. What overlaps do you see between pandemic preparedness for health workforce and surgical systems strengthening? Um, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies. Um, you, remember, you recall that in May 2015, the World Health Assembly passed a resolution 68.15, mandating member countries to include emergency and essential surgical obstetrics and anesthesia care as integral component of universal health coverage. This resolution and mandate have been a wake up call for the Federal Minister of Health to take action to develop and complement the processes of ensuring appropriate surgical skills. And as the Director of Health Services then in 2018, I proposed to government to implement this resolution. A committee was put in place and I was privileged to chair that committee. A five year strategy plan 2019 to 2024 was developed, launched and has been implemented in Nigeria today in ensuring the availability of appropriate and adequate human resources for health. Now I see a considerable overlap between pandemic preparedness for the health, health force and surgical system strengthening. Surgical and uh, surgical, uh, health, uh, surgical uh, system strengthening and pandemic preparation are almost based on the known and the unknown. Pandemics are usually unknown and in preparedness, it is certain that with global interconnectedness and the mobility of people across the world, a highly infectious organism in one town or in one country can travel across the world in as little time as 36 hours. So every country will be on standby for any eventful activity. During pandemics, it is crucial that health security systems are in place to ensure good surveillance, reporting, and the prevention of widespread transmission of such infections. Nigeria was on top of preparation and expectation before the index case was diagnosed. For surgical system strengthening, 
Surgical conditions are known and expected some symptoms and signs to occur in emergencies. However, the particular time and situation in which adequate surgical skills or uh, resources will be required are largely unknown. So it is advisable to prepare human resource for health and be expectant in all these issues. Now, to, to generally prepare, countries must assess their capacity before any expected or pandemics occurs. This should be by identifying her needs, noting her strength, her opportunities, and defining the gaps and fill it up in readiness for any situation of emergencies or pandemics. For surgical system strengthening, we need to identify the commonest surgical cases, do needs assessment, and based on that, provide infrastructure, basic equipment, ambulances, drugs, medical consumables, human resource for health, build their capacity and capability to improve their skills, knowledge, willingness, teamwork, and ready for timely intervention when it occurs. This was what we did in our, in our committee to solve the surgical and obstetric issues. Any nation will ensure readiness to strengthen her surgical system as part of her national system and system security development for achievement of universal health coverage. So no matter the amount of resources available, there's a need for us to be ready for both pandemics and then surgical um, uh, 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 system strengthening. Over to you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Joseph. Um, we know that investment in human resources for health requires money. And many health systems and ministries of health across the globe are suffering. Uh, budgets have run out. So let's move on and uh, talk a little bit to Dr. Kirana Prestari, expert staff to the Minister of Health and acting head of HRH Directorate, Minister of Health, Republic of Indonesia. Dr. Kirana, let's talk about investments. What investments to manage this vast health workforce have yielded the biggest impact in the pandemic response? And relatedly, how have you been able to bring health work voices to the forefront during the pandemic? Four minutes, Dr. Pristari. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ross. Our investment first in human resource information system, we call it HRIs, as a primary health worker data source. And the second is capacity building uh, to use it in our uh, decentralized context. This is very critical to our pandemic response. First, for our HRI's uh, investment, our policy priority of improving quality and robustness of the health worker data. We started in 2013, but then we improved our health information system and since 2019, we work with partners, including USAID and also HRC 2030 program to address different contacts, capacity and resources to make sure that we understand where every health worker was located, what their skills are, and also to know the need and the gap. HRA is interoperable operable with other ministry information system. We were able to establish this arrangement under our national health workforce account. We have technical working group and this technical working group is led by the Ministry of Health. An interconnected systems help improve efficiency of all health workforce process. Registration, new certification and renewal, planning to produce health worker based on our existing and future need. And also we could support the district government to deploy contractor health professional. In response to the pandemic, we also use the data on our health information system to map health workers to, de to determine the search capacity need. We also were able to ensure our emergency hospital were well staffed 
because we could contract the additional health professional for this emergency hospital. We also use the data to distribute our uh, incentive for, the, for this contractor health professional. Second, our HRI's capacity building at all level of health offices. Because Indonesia is decentralized uh, country, we have more than 500 districts. We have to develop and also encourage the district government to use this uh, information system. Uh, our office uh, motivate and also support the district and provincial health office to identify their needs on data collection, analysis the data, data storage, and also utilize the data for the planning and decision making. And for the COVID to respond to the pandemic, we also use the data of the health workers to plan to vaccinate all the 1.1 million health workers in Indonesia. We started the vaccination uh, on January 2021, and then we can finish for the first dose uh, during uh, the first four months. So then now we already cover all uh, 1.9 million health workers uh, vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pistari. I will come back to you uh, to speak a little bit more specifically on voices on the forefront. But now I would like to uh, travel to the uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, and speak to Ms. Gla Azmametova, the leading specialist Department of Organization of Medical Care and Public Health, Ministry of Health and Social Development, the Keg Republic. Uh, Ms. Gulna. Tell us a little bit about one of the key challenges faced by the CAG health system during the pandemic and how the ministry is responding to this. We know that across countries, these challenges are emerging, not just the shortages of health care, the need to build capacity as other panelists have mentioned, new diseases, the need to align the system, the need to use the data. What is happening in the keg and what are the challenges that you are facing there? Гульнас, расскажите нам об одной из ключевых проблем, с которой столкнулась система здравоохранения Кыргызстана во время пандемии и о том, как министерство отреагировало на нее. Спасибо большое. Здравствуйте, уважаемые коллеги. Я тоже очень рада, что вы дали мне выступить на этом мероприятии. Коронавирус выступил лучшими экспертами и обнажил многие проблемы здравоохранения Кыргызской Республики. Несмотря на то, что укомплектованность в стране медицинскими сестрами составляет 95-96%, во время COVID-19 мы столкнулись с кадровым кризисом, который был связан с нехваткой медицин, не нехваткой медицинской сестер, а именно качеством их подготовки и системы организации работы медсестры. В связи с системной работой, распределенной по функциям, работа медсестра была направлена на выполнение назначения врача. В больничных палатах работали три типа медсестер. Это процедурная, палатная поставая, перевязочная, и каждый из которых оказывал медицинские услуги 30-40 пациентам. Нагрузка была слишком высокой, и медсестры не могли обеспечить надлежащий уход за пациентом. Thank you for giving the speech and for giving the floor. So the coronavirus acted as the best expert and exposed many Uh, problems in the health system of the Kyrgyz Republic, despite the fact that the staffing level of nurses and uh, nurses in the country is quite high, which is it is uh, around 95-96% during COVID-19. We faced a staffing crisis, which was not related to the lack of nurses, but to the quality and <clears throat> capability of nurse nurses Um, and due to the systemic work distributed across functions, the nurses' work was focused on the following uh, the physician's orders. There were three types of nurses working in the hospital wards. 
procedural ward, post, and dressing, each providing medical services uh, to 30 to 40 patients every day. The workload was too high and the nurses could not provide adequate care. Uh, когда в июне 2020 года в стране регистрировались сотни новых случаев да, в день, и в больницах критически не хватало мест для пациентов, медицинские работники были крайне перегружены. Многие врачи были инфицированы и заболели COVID-19, и наступил кадровый коллапс. Uh, when there were hundreds of cases, new, uh, uh, daily cases in June 2020, the hospitals were critically short of patient beds and health care workers were extremely overburned. Many physicians were infected and got infected with COVID-19 and there was a stuffing collapse in the country. Критическая ситуация с COVID-19 дала нам возможность продвинуть внедрение расширения функций медсестры и предоставила медсестрам больше автономии для более внимательного отношения к пациентам. Мы работали над реформированием сектора сестринского дела в течение пяти лет, но прогресс был медленным из-за сопротивления медицинского сообщества. Uh, the critical COVID-19 situation gave us an opportunity to advance the implementation and expansion of the nursing function and give nurses more autonomy to be more attentive to patients. Uh, we've been working to reform the nursing sector for more than five years, but progress has been very slow because of the resistance from the medical community. Однако, основываясь на предыдущих реформах при поддержке проекта ИСАИД «Устойчивая система здравоохранения», мы объединили функции трех типов медсестер, ориентированных на выполнение указания врача, в одну роль медсестры, ориентированную именно на пациента, которую назвали «Универсальная медсестра» и внедрили в трех пилотных больницах, где обслуживали пациентов с COVID-19. Uh, however, uh, building on previous reforms with support from USAID LHSS project, we managed to merge the functions of three types of physician-directed nurses into one patient-centered nurse nursing role called mm -hmm. the universal nurse and implemented in three pilot hospitals serving patients with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Благодаря модели универсальная медсестра мы сократили число пациентов, за которыми ухаживала каждая медсестра с 30-40 человек до 12 в общей палате и до трех в отделении интенсивной терапии. Медсестры могли самостоятельно оценивать состояние пациентов, ставить сестринские диагнозы, планировать и оценивать результаты. Результаты лечения пациентов улучшились при том же количестве персонала. With the support, uh, with the launch of universal uh, nurse model, we managed to reduce the number of patients in each nurse cared for from uh, 30 uh, to 12 in the general ward and three in the intensive care unit. Uh, the mm -hmm. nurses were able to assess patients independently, make nursing diagnosis and plan and evaluate the results of treatment Patient, uh, patients' <clears throat> uh, results improved with the, the same number of staff. So, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kula. Uh, thank you very much for addressing that issue of how the universal model uh, prepared your nurses to respond to future emergencies. I think that. There are some lessons for other countries to learn uh, from Kyrgyzstan. I'd like now to uh, go back and explore more lessons learned. And I will start again uh, with uh, Dr. Rosvia Nima, representing the Minister of Health uh, from Uganda. Uh, Dr. Rose, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how or what lessons we have learned during the second wave. Uh, Uganda recently experienced a second wave and it was much harder on the healthcare system than the first wave. So the question is, how did you support the workers to address the wave and what lessons do we take forward? 
Dr. Yanyima, you are uh, Hello, thank you very much. Four um, minutes, please. Yes. Um, having, of course, trained and recruited a number of nurses and other health workers, of course, increasing on the workforce, having increased on our oxygen therapy capacity, having recruited more um, uh, partners to work with, to support, especially the, uh, the supply and chain management, uh, especially for drugs and sundries and for especially protective gear and uh, following the presidential directive to increase production of some of the requirements locally in Uganda, uh, that really boosted our capacity for response. And uh, that was after the experience from the first wave. And we thought we had prepared ourselves. But the second wave came and really threw us off guard because the numbers were a little bit more than the first wave. And again, we had to go on the drawing board. Um, the ministry had to get waivers to recruit more uh, human resource and train them very fast. And uh, even those who are in training for critical care, we did it the way that you do or in, in, in war, if you already have um, the soldiers you've trained halfway, they are better than those you haven't. Really, people already have a skill, but if you're training them to do a thorough critical care nursing and they've been exposed in some way, we had to withdraw them halfway through the training, but they did a good job and they were committed. And what helped us is that uh, we improved our supply chain of protective gear and uh, our health workers were well protected and not contracting the disease. Actually, the ones who contracted the disease first were those who are not working in the hot areas in the COVID treatment unit, and that gave the confidence. And of course, some little incentive that they were receiving. But come the opportunity for vaccination, of course, we prioritize the health workers and there was a small a bit of uptake, but it improved with the, the confidence when they saw that others who are getting vaccinated were uh, really not getting any uh, side effect. But of course, as a long term, uh, the Ministry of Health continues to work with uh, training institutions and also working closely with the recruitment agency for the Ministry of Health, that is the the, the Health Service Commission uh, to formalize the, the contract staff who are recruited for COVID into the health system. And that will help to strengthen the human uh, workforce in, in health. And we hope that this will be a continuous process to improve, improve the staffing levels. And in addition, we continue to acquire more equipment. We are planning on getting uh, CT scanners in regional referral hospitals, and that will reduce on the referral system. Of course, uh, patients' are outcomes should be better if they are treated early enough nearer home. So it's really yeah. a comprehensive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yanima. I think, I mean, you raise a really good point. Uh, preparedness is, is key. But even when you are prepared, the second wave did demonstrate that that preparation was not as adequate as uh, uh, perhaps the country thought. And I'm sure that this is probably a similar experience across other countries. So should a third wave hit, how do we mobilize and look after the human resources that we have and build capacity to be able to take on a third wave in the likely event that it will occur? Let's travel briefly to uh, Kisumu again, uh, Dr. Ganda. Uh, we know that supporting health workers is a key to health systems strengthening and delivering health for all. Can you tell us more about your efforts 
to achieve universal health care and how these efforts will prepare your country for future health emergencies. Thank you, Dr. Ganda. Yes, thank you very That's much. Please. Please. Thank you very much for that question again. And I think it's uh, right landing on the right place. As a county in Kisumu, we are one of the four out of the 47 counties that uh, the national government used to pilot the universal healthcare program under President Kenyatta's big four development agenda. And we had several big lessons which we had from the first uh, wave of the pilot. And one of it was that we had a lot of curative services focus. And most of our clients at the usability of the level four and level five hospitals were very high. And this had to shift when uh, COVID came because we learned that um, uh, initially we were keeping all our patients in facilities and it was not a sustainable model. We were very scared of sending them back down to the health centers and to the communities in the home-based care. But that again taught us that it can work. So in Kisumu, we are piloting, we are running a major policy shift towards primary health care and uh, community health care. And we're investing heavily in this. We are partnering with the national government as well as development and implementing partners to strengthen the community health systems and the primary health care facilities in our county. For one, we are co-investing with our partners, leveraging on their resources and expertise to activate the inactive community health structure. Some of our community health structures were no longer functional, the community committees were not sitting. And so uh, we are working uh, with our partners to be able to compensate them, to, be able to, to, to activate them. Uh, we initiated and created a policy that made it possible to pay stipends to community health volunteers in the appreciation of their work. And this was lucky for us because it happened at the right time just before we got into our second wave. And those, this includes an initiative to ensure that all community health workers are covered under the National Health Insurance Scheme. So that motivates them to be able to, uh, to assist back in the community whenever we have clients. Um, we are investing also in data and intelligence where we are investing in digitalization of the community health. Since last year, we are partnering one of our organizations, uh, Living Goods and others, to equip the community health workforce with digital tools. And that allows us to move away from manual and paper-based systems. Now, collecting data uh, in, in a digital system allows you to be able to re make real-time decisions because it is easier for you to be able to map out where disease is, where the clients are and what problems are there. And secondly, it also makes it easier to do task shifting. Kisumu County is also piloting a, a digital community health information system that attempts to task shift a treatment of minor ailments to the community health volunteers. And this is done through uh, digital algorithms where the, patient, the community health worker can ask a question and when the answer is yes, it clicks yes, it takes them to the next algorithm. So it happens automatically and it's able to assist them to, to treat patients. And that will be useful in future whenever we want to task shift to the lower levels. Our primary healthcare facilities have not been left out and we are working with other partners to come up with dashboards. We already have dashboards that help us from the laboratory tests. When a test starts negative, it automatically appears in our dashboard. Um, and so we are able to synthesize this data and uh, allocate disease patterns from the data entry which has been made from the health workers in the field. Finally, we are creating uh, multidisciplinary teams which are covering community health units and we are piloting this in one of our places, uh, in one of our sub-counties. And these community health units are headed by family practitioners. Uh, we might not have enough family practitioners, but community, uh, sorry, clinical officers probably will head some of these uh, multidisciplinary units in the community. We definitely cannot forget the higher levels of care. And uh, of course, we have established a COVID center, which in the future will remain as an infectious disease unit. And it has been designed also as a training center to allow both digital training and physical training of health workers. So I think the second part of my question asks how these efforts will prepare the county for future emergencies. Mm -hmm. And for me, that boils down to access and availability of reliable and real-time data. This we cannot underscore. Uh, one of the main challenges we have experienced in, in the past and across the region, and especially when we have our sec second wave is that sometimes when you lack adequate and timely data, you cannot make swift decisions. And so if we succeed in digitalizing our health systems and they work with our dashboards, we'll be better prepared in terms of disease surveillance and response. 
and we can leverage on the community health workforce at any time uh, to be able to deliver primary health care or, or uh, to deliver information back to the communities and of course mm -hmm. be able to, to uh, do things like telemedicine across board when uh, transport is no longer available. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, multidisciplinary teams who live within the, within the communities will make it possible for us to form what I'm calling an epidemiological bubble. That means that uh, these community units can be confined whenever there is disease, and you already have health workers who are in that community unit, and they're able to deliver the services, of course, uh, with the consultation from their colleagues, the specialized units, and they're able to cover that unit and make uh, appropriate referrals uh, where necessary. Uh, we have invested in, um, uh, in, in a center that is able to receive information. We're calling a public health emergency response center that can also act as a medicine platform. So okay, okay. Can I network? Can I network? I think Thank you so much, Dr. Ganda. We have a lot of questions and I would like to get to those questions, but I actually was going to call upon uh, Dr. Amedou uh, Joseph from Nigeria, uh, if he's still online to expand this conversation about experiences. We know that Nigeria, like Uganda and other countries have had uh, an experience of Ebola. Uh, is Dr. Amedou still online? Um, I'll move on to Dr. Kirana as we wait for Dr. Amedou to come back to take that question about how they are leveraging the experience of Ebola in Nigeria to inform current policies with uh, the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Pristari, um, I want to revisit a question I posed before. How have you been able to bring health work voices to the forefront during the pandemic response? And looking ahead, how are your health and health workforce policies helping prepare Indonesia for future health emergencies. Let's start with the voices on the forefront and then look ahead to how you're preparing Indonesia for future emergencies. Dr. Pristari, four minutes, please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we fully understand that the dynamic and constant need for the SIRS improvement. Before we relied heavily on manual reporting system and now we are transitioning to digital systems. This is a big change for our country. There, is, there are vast capacity and infrastructure gaps. Our approaches ensure that human resource for health are heard and their needs are met. We created a mobile uh, application and also uh, some tools to help workers that they can keep their own information in our information system uh, up to date. We create two-way communication to get updates from health workers, and then the second, continuous medical education and sharing resources. We also sought the diversity of our data sources across the health labor market. We collaborate with our professional organization, including their regional chapters across the country. Now we already have collaboration more than uh, 11 organizations that their health information system uh, interoperate with our uh, information system. In this pandemic situation, District and provincial government is really listen to the health workers during the pandemic and respond to provide the PPE and also distribute the vaccine. They also elevate health workers role in communicating risk and recommending mitigation measures. We had already known that health workers also are the essential for our health system but we appreciated them more during the pandemic. Central government and also the local government give additional incentive for the 
health workers during the pandemic who give directly uh, health services for the patient. And for the your second question, and your for your second question, we have a big lesson learned from this pandemic. So the government, the Ministry of Health already established transformation uh, policy into our health system. There are six pillars for the transformation, including for the transformation for human resource for health and also digital transformation. And for our human resource for health transformation focuses on both public and private providers to improve our resilience and response for future health emergencies. Supply of health workers in all health facility. During the pandemic, we open emergency hospital in several area. We have to recruit and train them before they provide the services. We improve the cap competency through education and training. We have to have strong career development for health workers to make more uh, effective retain in the area and also equal distribution of competence health workers across the country. On digital transformation, Indonesia government has a strong and committed uh, vision to, to have wide one data policy which translated in one health data policy for Ministry of Health. And the human resource information system will be the core and sole source for the HRH data in Indonesia. So we hope that across the country, more than 500 district, we, we will have link and interoperate uh, information system so we can have the real data and we can use the data for the planning and also for the decision making. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pistari. Um, I'm gonna hear, um, I think one more question from um, uh, to Dr. Joseph Amedou, and then we are going to transition to the multiple questions we have from our participants. So thank you so much for being patient and for staying on the call with us this afternoon. It is really a powerful conversation with these influential leaders. Dr. Medu, can you close us out uh, by talking a little bit about the Ebola experience in Nigeria and how that was leveraged to inform current initiatives in the pandemic response? Dr. Amedou, back to you. Five minutes, please. Thank you very much. You know, the Nigerian experience with Ebola helped really in um, several impactful, to, to provide several impact, impactful initiatives that we took during the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. After the news of the, uh, the world news on the, uh, on the presence of Ebola virus, of course, Nigeria was expecting an index case for it to take the next step. So um, the health workforce and related policies initiative that uh, were most impactful during the pandemic included the review of the existing health policies as regards contagious and infectious diseases. These were reviewed, updated to meet the needs of the time uh, in preparation for the uh, uh, pandemic. So there was a high level political commitment by the government. And, and so the president of the, of the country initiated a central command and control system with instructions following uh, uh, flowing from the presidential task force and implemented by the entire health sector under the direction of the national coordinator of the Ebola crisis. So the high level involvement of the political class provided absolute cooperation and collaboration from all the stakeholders. And on that note, there was a, the, the swift closure of the international airports and state borders to limit the one ton spread of the coronavirus along with the implementation of the phased lockdown in the country actually helped the situation. Also, this restriction gave opportunity to government and the, the, and the stakeholders to take decisive action and prepare to prevent the rapid spreading of the COVID-19 uh, COVID infections. So the then President Task Force on COVID-19 ensured that the first suspected in the case was tested 
and confirmed immediately using the Ebola protocol, which was already in place. Mm -hmm. So Nigeria was able to build up and rapidly expand nationwide laboratory services, the capacity for testing COVID, COVID infection, and of course, with support from partners to ensure that this is uh, actually done. The Nigerian Center for Disease Control, who is an agency of government responsible for uh, infectious diseases, was activated and it performed fully in ensuring that the entire country is covered by their presence. And that helped also in the screening and identifying um, uh, COVID patients. So there was appropriate capacity building of doctors and other health workers, the nurses, laboratory scientists, pharmacists, community health workers, volunteers, and the media. They were all involved cooperatively to ensure that the spread was limited. At that time, of course, there were only very few COVID-19 cases in the entire African continent. So one can imagine if that uh, if prevention were not, were not made by that time, the country will have uh, had a, a devastating effect. So the engagement of the private sector in the fight against COVID-19 was a, an initiative that greatly was greatly impactful. And that, that led to the making the availability of personal protective equipment and the health supplies possible. Many of these initiatives were informed by Nigeria's experience with the Ebola outbreak in West Africa several years ago. Of course, Solution centers and PPEs were provided across the country as funds were made available. So ensuring full compliance with the non-pharmaceutical approach of social distancing, wearing of face masks, washing hands with soap and use of hand sanitizers were all initiatives that government allowed and brought up quickly on board for the people to be familiar with the prevention of such things. So lots of sensitization and enlightenment using radio, television, dramas, social media, religious organizations, traditional rulers and opinion leaders to reach the population also helped in spreading the news of the, the coronavirus. And so people were aware, even both at the local level and at the national level, people were aware and were prepared to prevent them. However, the global nature of COVID-19 pandemic substantially increased the scale, intensity, and pace of these initiatives to limit the negative impact of the pandemic on the nation. So all, what happened was, was because of the, 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 the political involvement and commitment, it was easier for people to collaborate with themselves and make sure that they carry out the institution of governments. And of course, adequate funding is required for not just uh, coronavirus uh, infection, but for other pandemics, for us to be prepared for the, 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 the unforeseeable, un unforeseeable future uh, pandemics. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Medu. What a powerful hour. So many lessons for us uh, to pick from so many lessons to carry away with us, so many thought provoking ideas for us to implement in our own countries to enhance the health workforce, draft new human resource for health policies, the use of data to inform what we are doing, attention to new diseases, a sobering reminder that the pandemic is not over, how we can continue to address the shortages, supply chain management as a crucial component in our strategies, but also leveraging from these experiences, leveraging them to be able to respond to future emergencies. There are concerns, of course, we hear these amazing testimonials from Kenya, Nigeria, Uganda, Indonesia, um, the Keg Republic, and so on. There are still concerns that what countries are doing is simply not enough when it comes to human resources for health. Um, and I think that is an expanded conversation we needed to continue to have. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a wonderful hour to uh, hear from our participants. I um, request that, uh, can you mute, please? Ah, thank you uh, very much. Um, it's been a wonderful hour. Now I would like to transition us to the many questions that we have um, in the chat room. I will start with the questions that are addressing the community health work programs that several of our panelists have talked about. 
for country leaders focusing on these programs, what is being done to institutionalize and sustain the community work pre-service training? Um, I do believe Dr. Ganda did mention uh, something to do with community health initiative, as well as uh, Dr. Bianima from Uganda. Any one of you want to take this question? What is being done to institutionalize and sustain this expanded workforce, the community health workforce, especially with pre-service training? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, this is Dr. Ganda from Kenya. I think um, this is one of the things which I mentioned. Uh, we have come up with a bill uh, that we're calling the Community Health Services Bill that actually spells out what level of training or what kind of training that the community health volunteer requires before they're actually recruited to, to start working. So this is actually going to come along. That anytime a new one is recruited. Apart from that, the national government is also coming up with a, a formal training mm -hmm. program for community health services. And I think there will be several smaller courses in a diploma and a certificate level for, for this kind of workforce. So that in future it becomes easier to be able to harness from, from such kind of people with that knowledge uh, and adopt them in. Uh, currently, as we are doing the digitalization program in Kenya, uh, it is a prerequisite that you cannot receive your tablet before you undergo the full course of training, uh, which is a three-week training. We are doing this in partnership with our, uh, with our partners, Living Good. So it's, uh, we are contributing 50-50. So we train them for three weeks. Then they have the technical, the technical training for three weeks, and then they have the, the tablets given to them, uh, from which now they can learn how to use the, the program. So the program is just a small bit of it before the major training, which is running for three weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that there are also uh, related questions to that health care workers who are not being utilized at all, not just uh, the newer groups of uh, extended uh, community health care workers. There was a comment uh, in the chat about health care workers who are simply sitting at home and not being utilized in the system. I think that it would be good to uh, revisit some of those strategies. Um, we know that this requires investment, as I mentioned earlier. There is a question here, how can multi, how can multilateral institutions, especially international finance institutions, help spur investment and retention of healthcare workers? And how can we help set the expectation about longer timelines needed to shift to domestic, to domestic funding sources? Um, I wonder if any of our uh, panelists would like to take this question on. How can financial institutions, international institutions help spur the investment and retention of healthcare workers? Dr. Medu, would, would you like to uh, take a stab at this question? Thank you very much. Um, I, I think um, the whole world is a village, so to speak, because an infection <laughs> in one country can always spread to another country. So there's a need for collaboration and cooperation among the entire people of the world. So we, I think that the, um, the partners can be involved in ensuring that there is adequate preparation in all the countries for emerging diseases. Uh, also, there's a need for us to prepare for uh, surgical obstetric and 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 uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and anesthetic cases because you cannot you, I mean look at the cases of uh, say appendicitis obstetric labor or accident no one prepares for this but you can prepare your health force to be ready and also provide materials to get ready in case this happens and this can help in developing the entire health system health is security so if any part of the world is not in good health of course it will definitely affect that world. So there's a need for partners uh, to invest in, in health security in all the nations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Medu. I think um, our listeners would like to actually hear specific examples of uh, multi-sectoral stakeholder groups. Which groups have, for example, our panelists worked with specifically to increase investments in this area? 
Dr. Pristari, do you, do you have think, some? Before, okay. Before I stop, can I, at this point, yes, appreciate yeah. the work of Smile Train in Nigeria? Smile Train is an NGO that helps our surgical team to improve on the training and capacity building of the surgeons and anesthetists, the nurses, to ensure that there's appropriate preparation for surgical issues. So I must appreciate the effort, the effort of Smile Train in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Medo. Uh, any other example of stakeholders uh, in this field who are engaging with ministries in different countries? Dr. Bianima? Thank you very much. I think we need all the stakeholders on board uh, because we are at war and uh, any weapon would be of use. So financial institutions uh, would come in and have any stakeholders through which uh, these funds can be channeled. I know like already established institutions within the country, like agencies like the CDC, IDI, of course, those institutions um, uh, receive funds towards the COVID fight, and that uh, leaves some uh, room for the ministry also to concentrate on the other issues. And of course, um, Many times uh, the, the health workforce is limited because of the budgetary constraint and uh, the ministry cannot recruit more because they do not have the budget to remunerate. But also when these financial institutions come in and give incentives and it helps in retaining, if they come in and they sponsor some training, that is a kind of relief. So that partnership has worked very well. And uh, on the second wave, at the peak of it all, one organization came in, partnered with the uh, WHO to recruit uh, several nurses and they trained them and deployed them into, and, and, and even uh, medical doctors to beef up the teams. And this came with the uh, remuneration package and they were motivated to work. So. Uh, we do welcome partners and uh, they are very, very uh, helpful and they bring in that dimension of bringing resources, uh, training, and, you know, we, we need to harness all this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Bianyu, I'm going to come back to you uh, with a specific question for you, uh, but I'll let uh, uh, Dr. Pristari uh, make a comment about uh, the uh, stakeholder groups that she is working with in Indonesia. Yeah, uh, when we develop our HR information system, uh, we started with our uh, uh, health provider we, who already in the health facility, but then we realized that we cannot work only the government, uh, government only, but we also to, need to reach the private health facility and also we have to collaborate with the professional organization because they have their own information system uh, to, to gather all the data for their member. And also uh, during the development of this information system that we need to also have the link with the education sectors because they have very strong information system for all students and we can use their uh, information on their graduate to, uh, to link with our information system. Mm -hmm. And during the pandemic, we also have collaboration with the Ministry of Home Affairs on how to uh, supervise how the local government uh, provide the incentive for the health workers. So uh, this kind of collaboration is very uh, important because uh, Ministry of Health cannot cover all the issues related to the human resource across the country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ganda, you wanted to respond? Yes, maybe I'll, uh, you allow me to, to make the, the discussion a little bit different. But one mm. of the things that we can do, we know that the public health system, the government in, in Africa cannot employ all the health workers. And we know that many of our healthcare workers are outside there, they don't have jobs. So one of the things that we need to do is also to empower the private health system. We must incorporate the private health system as 
part of health. So that when we are discussing health, we are talking about private and public. Now, why our people cannot visit private hospitals a lot of times is because of uh, affordability. They're not able to afford and a good percentage of uh, clients stay at home because they can't afford. Now, if we empower the client to be able to walk into a facility, whether private or public, then you will have solved that problem. You will see a rapid rise in patients who are uh, going into facilities mm -hmm. to receive care. And this we saw during our universal healthcare pilot program, where utilization of facilities went up. We had almost 253% increase in the patients who are walking into our facilities, meaning that these patients were probably not walking into facilities because of the cost barrier. Uh, the cost barrier that you have to pay some little money for get a card or some little money to get a, a booklet, that enough is enough, is, is, that is enough to buy them. So for this population, if we ensure that they are able to access a health insurance cover, then they will be able to walk into private hospitals, and public hospitals, and still get healthcare uh, at whatever cost. And that probably might increase the amount of workers that are increased because for every private hospital that operates, then you need health workers. So when we empower the private sector, we also increase the health worker absorption uh, into the system. We know that we might not be able to get 100%. I know Britain is, is, is importing nurses from, from, from Africa uh, and Canada is importing from, from Britain. So that means that the health worker numbers are never enough. But in Africa, we have a problem that we have the health workers. They are outside there. They have no jobs. And yet we have patients who require uh, a treatment so, or require attention. So I think the health insurance is something that uh, our partners can critically think about empowering one. Thank you very much. Uh, we have so many, many questions. Um, Dr. Bianima, you spoke about the increased task force training for nurses. We know that there's been a shortage for a long time and the ones available have been overworked and underpaid and the morale was low. So when the pandemic hit, we were at a disadvantage. What has the government learned from this and how is it ensuring that moving forward the health force feels supported and well compensated. I think this is a question probably for every panelist. Uh, Dr. Bianima, briefly, one minute, if you have an answer to this question, I would like to move on after you to um, uh, Ms. Bruna and ask another question about nursing and nursing workforce. Thank you very much. Indeed, it's a question for all of us. Uh, we know remuneration is really a hygiene factor, and we need to look on all aspects that raise the morale of health workers. And uh, providing them protective gear, providing them equipment to use, you know, all these are, are incentives. But of course, we have the presidential directive that uh, the health workers, the scientists should have better remuneration, and we are still looking forward to that. But of course, at the peak of the pandemic, we had to uh, delays, of course, in, in providing in incentive because of the bureaucracies. You have to get clearance from the, the public service on how much incentive should be given to the frontline workers. And then you find that uh, the budget is exhausted, and then there's time to request for more funds. But uh, it's a continuous engagement of the health workers and as long as they know that one, they are protected, two, there's an effort to get more people on board so that they don't get the burnt out phenomenon. And uh, three, that even if the incentive delays, it will come. Um, uh, that positive engagement is always good. Communicate, 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 but don't stop at communicating, resolve their issues give them what to use, give them their due incentive. I think that is the way we approached it and uh, we were fairly successful. Over to you, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Kruna, I think you, you can help us close this out uh, before I ask a final question to every one of you. We have only six minutes uh, left, folks, and we have more than 20 questions uh, unanswered at the moment. But let's go uh, to Ms. Kruna in Kyrgyzstan. Um, how have other countries' experiences in mobilizing the health workforce within the country 
been in combating pandemic. But I, I think I would like to shift that back to specifically the nursing workforce, because you mentioned in your uh, responses to our questions that uh, Kyrgyzstan has a specific model that seems to be working for the nursing workforce. So going forward, looking to the future, five years from now, how do we mobilize efficiently the nursing workforce to continue to respond to health emergencies and to strengthen the healthcare system? Кульнас, как универсальная модель, подготовила Кыргызстан к будущим к чрезвычайным ситуациям в области здравоохранения, и как мы можем мобилизовать медсестер в будущем, чтобы ответить на такие чрезвычайные ситуации в области здравоохранения. Спасибо большое. Но в настоящее время у нас есть эффективная кадровая модель которая позволяет нам добиваться лучших результатов здравоохранения при том же количестве врачей и медсестер. Мы планируем расширить эту модель на первичный уровень здравоохранения для того, чтобы у нас был ориентированный на пациента, эффективный медицинский персонал и был готов предоставить основные услуги при любых чрезвычайных ситуациях, которые могут возникнуть в будущем в области здравоохранения. Модель универсальная медсестра способствует обеспечению готовности к пандемии, так и в целом укреплению системы здравоохранения. Спасибо. So at the moment uh, we have an effective staffing model that allows us to have better health outcomes with the, with the same number of doctors and nurses. Uh, we plan to expand this model to the primary care level to ensure that we have a patient-centered effective healthcare workforce, and we are prepared to provide essential services for any future healthcare emergencies that may arise. Uh, the universal nurse model contributes to the pandemic preparedness as well as overall health system strengthening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have a few minutes left and we have a lot of questions. I'm going to request the organizers of this conversation to please post these questions on a platform that can be accessed by the majority of our participants and also a special request to the panelists to help us respond uh, question by question. Uh, we have more than 20 questions left and there's really no time for us to get to everything. So a final thought, a final parting thought before I hand us over back to David briefly to thank our sponsors. Looking forward in five years, what do countries need to do to prepare adequately? What is it that we need to focus on that we are not currently doing? And what is it that we need to strengthen that is actually working? Uh, let us start with uh, uh, Dr. Joseph Amedou, Senior Director, Federal Ministry of Health, Nigeria. Thank you for being here today. Dr. Amedou, you are up. One minute. Thank you very much. Um, I think the important here is to critically uh, be committed to ensuring that our primary healthcare works. Because if I can, about 90% of our cases will be resolved at the primary care level. And so if government and, and, and partners and stakeholders invest in ensuring that the primary health care functions, not just by putting building, but by ensuring that there are facilities, there are human resources, there are equipment, there are drugs and there are services. I think in the next five years, our health, our health system will, 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 will be threatened. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Pristari, parting thought, one minute. Thank you. So uh, I think, for the big country like Indonesia, we need to have a strong uh, human resource information system because we need to have better planning and also uh, better distribution for the, for the health workforce uh, over the uh, nationwide. So 
uh, using this uh, information system will be uh, will be uh, support our health system that we can provide the better quality and accessible uh, services for the uh, people. So uh, please invest in, in information system to support the health workforce. Thank you very much, Dr. Pristari. Uh, Ms. Gurna, what is it that we need to do to prepare for the future? One minute. Гульнас, вопрос, что мы должны сейчас предпринять, чтобы подготовиться к будущему, будущим чрезвычайным ситуациям? Что мы должны предпринять сейчас, чтобы улучшить вообще систему здравоохранения? Ну, в нашей стране мы сейчас вот планируем именно планирование кадровых ресурсов, правительственные ресурсы. Uh, да, и uh, самое главное – это uh, повышение квалификации медиц всех uh, медицинских кадров это uh, на обучение. Uh, если со стороны медсестер, uh, мы uh, вообще после uh, всех этих ситуаций мы сейчас uh, планируем провести реформу сестринского образования, uh, вообще реформа медицинского образования в соответствии каталогов компетенций, профессиональных стандартов, которые требуются именно на практическом уровне. Но это один из направлений, которые мы, вот именно человеческие ресурсы, да, повышение квалификации и планирование кадр. Our government is um, MOH is planning to conduct nursing reform. Those are the main um, directions uh, where we want to work in our country. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Bianima, parting thought. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, of course, we need to start with disease prevention and uh, do a lot of health education during the pandemic, we sent out a lot of educative material to the community. I think we need to keep that and uh, also to strengthen our referral system so that patients are referred appropriately in time, increase on the health workforce because these patients need the care and also improve our supply chain management because the workforce will not work without the supplies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Ganda, over to you before I turn it over to David to close us out. Thank you. I think all has been said, the health system strengthening mm. pillars, but for me, information, intelligence, and evidence-based response is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, what a packed hour. Uh, <laughs> we were stepping over us. So sorry, we have stolen a few more minutes of your time. We thank you for being here. Thank you to our amazing panelists, Dr. Rosie Bianima, Senior Health Officer, Ministry of Health, Dr. Gregory Ganda, Country Executive Committee Member for Health Services, Chisumu County, Kenya, Dr. Pristari Kiana, expert staff the Minister of Health, Department uh, of Human Resources for Health, Ministry of Health, Republic of Indonesia, Ms. Guna Azma Metova, leading specialist, Department of Organization and Medical Care, Public Health, Minister of Health, Social Development, KEG Republic, and Dr. Joseph Amedu, Senior Director, Federal Ministry of Health in Nigeria, and Dr. Rose Bianima, uh, uh, Ministry of Health Uganda, and of course our keynote speaker who was earlier introduced by David Dr. Raji Tajuddin, Head of Division of Public Health Institutes and Research at Africa CDC. Thank you for being here. Thank you to the panelists for joining this conversation. David, thank you for hosting us and for being here. Please thank our sponsors. Over to you. Thanks. This has been a really fascinating panel. I think we've learned a lot today. We've heard from top experts at all levels of government in critically important countries around the world. We've learned a lot from their experiences, and we have a lot to take in regarding preparing for the next pandemic. Uh, let's take these voices to policymakers. We know they're meeting at the United Nations this week. There's a really critically important summit tomorrow. 
on the COVID-19 response and building back better. Uh, please join us for part two of this webinar series on September 28th. We're gonna hear from civil society leaders about what their experience has been and what they hope to, uh, how they hope to partner with governments uh, represented on the, on the panel today. Uh, so do tune in for September 28th. And I wanna thank all of the partners that came together uh, to make this possible. Uh, and also thanking all the panelists and our moderator, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nanyanga. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye.